Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello, I'm Joseph Pierce, and welcome to this episode of The Authority, where we'll be looking this week at one of the greatest poets who's ever lived. That's the great Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. Um, and um, I'm going to say quite a lot about why he's so important and why he's so brilliant and why everybody should know him, not just Catholics. But I've got to give a brief chronology of his life, some of the, the, the basic facts of his life first. So we've got who he is out of the way, so to speak, and then we'll worry about why he's so important. So he's born uh, on the 28th of July in 1844 at Stratford on Avon. Sorry, not Stratford on Avon. That's where Shakespeare was born. <laughs> Stratford Le Beau. Uh, in in Essex, it's actually really now since then it's been completely utterly swallowed up by the uh, the uh, enormous monster known as the London conurbation. So it's it's just part of East London now. But it was back in 1844, still a, a village on the edge of London. Um, so that's where he's born. 1844 um, and 1845 was both the Irish potato famine, which we've talked about somewhat in our episode uh, on. Um, the authority of St. John Henry Newman, but that is exactly what we're talking about now, because in 1845 was the Irish potato famine, but also the conversion of John Henry Newman, um, uh, and the importance of that to the, the Catholic cultural revival we've already discussed, but it uh, was specifically important to Gerald Manny Hopkins, as we shall see, even though he was only one year old when uh, Newman was received in the church. Um, in 1847, when he is only three years old, when Charlotte Bronte, uh, Charlotte Bronte's novel Jane Eyre is published, and the same year Emily Bronte's novel Wuthering Heights was published. We discussed both of those in the recent uh, episode. In 1863, he enters Balliol College in Oxford uh, for to pursue his uh, his bachelor's degree, his uh, his undergraduate um, degree. This is also the college at which um, Hilaire Belloc would study, but somewhat later. Belloc was actually not even born at this point. Um, uh, in 1864, so a year after um, Hopkins' arrival at Bailey College, Oxford, John Henry Newman publishes his spiritual autobiography, if, uh, if you want to call it that, his conversion story, Apologia Pro Vita Sua, which would have a very profound impact on English culture in general and on Hopkins in particular, because two years after that, Hopkins, as an undergraduate, is received into the Catholic Church by none other than St. John Henry Newman himself. So this great poet uh, is received into the church by a great saint and poet. In 1867, he graduates from Oxford University with first class honours, and he teaches for eight months at Newman's Oratory School in Birmingham. Uh, but then in 1868, he resolves to become a Catholic priest and specifically a Jesuit. Um, this causes um, uh, a, a rift in his family. His parents uh, are, are devout Anglicans, but very anti-Catholic. And they never really forgive him for um, becoming a Catholic and then uh, training for priest the priesthood and specifically training for the Jesuit priesthood. The Jesuits were the... Uh, the, the part of the church that the, those who are knee-jerk in their anti-Catholicism are most uh, prejudiced against. So he begins training for the Jesuit priesthood in 1868. Uh, in 1872, he discovers the work of the uh, medieval Franciscan philosopher, uh, Dun Scotus. And he says, from this time, I was flush with a new enthusiasm. We will be talking about the importance of uh, the philosophy of uh, uh, John Dun Scotus uh, presently. In 1889, he st starts a year of, of a spiritual tree, contracts typhoid and dies on the 8th of June, 1889. So um, 
at the, still only 44 years old, so tragically young. And this is the thing about Hopkins, which is very important, is during his lifetime, uh, virtually none of his poetry was published. Um, uh, it, uh, so he was completely unknown outside of his small group of friends. Um, and uh, his first, the first edition of his poetry would not be published until just at the end of World War I in 1918. Uh, when they were published by an Oxford, Uni Oxford University Press edition edited by his friend, the poet Robert Bridges. So I often say that um, Hopkins is ahead of, or was ahead of his time. And I always qualify that because to say that someone's ahead of his time uh, is usually something said tritely, and it really means that somebody is fashionable, that someone is up to date. And if someone's up to date, we can be fairly sure that fairly soon they'll be out of date. Because as uh, because as um, uh, C.S. Lewis said, that, that fashions are always coming and going, but mostly going. In other words, if you're just up to date, you can be guaranteed to be out of date fairly quickly. So, but, but Hopkins was ahead of his time uh, in, a, in a very real measurable way because at his, during his time, his poetry was inaccessible to the readership. Even his friends, such as Robert Bridges, the poet, and the, the, the other Catholic convert poet, Coventry Patmore, um, they, they, they considered Hopkins to be poet, poetry to be bits of brilliance, but, but ultimately unreadable. Um, I think it was, I can't remember it was, whether it was Bridges or Patmore who said that Hopkins's poetry is like um, priceless gems embedded in impracticable quartz. So the gems of brilliance in the midst of sort of this, this stuff that you can't even get to, get beneath. So what? why is it that this person who can't be read, even by his friends, um, uh, during his own lifetime, during the 1870s and 1880s, um, should become one of the most popular poets of the 20th century, and not just one of the most popular, but one of the most celebrated as being modern, as doing new things, as being avant-garde. The two giants of modern poetry in the 20th century are T.S. Eliot, and uh, Jeremy Hopkins, but the the, the the latter wasn't even uh, <laughs> didn't even survive uh, to, to see the twentieth century. So he's a modern poet who's published forty years after his death. That is authentically being ahead of uh, his time. So why? What is it about Hopkins which was so new, so modern, so adventurous, so avant-garde? Well, uh, not surprisingly, we've talked at previous episodes in previous episodes of uh, the Authority about how uh, the, the various intellectual and cultural movements uh, play leapfrog, because we can't create anything ex nihilo. We can't create from nothing. We have to create from other things that already exist. Only God can create from nothing. We have to take things already here and do things with them. Therefore, if we don't like a particular time, a particular period, we can leapfrog over it and find something earlier, which is more conducive to, to, to what we like. So a large part of the Renaissance, sorry, yeah, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment was playing leapfrog over Christendom, over the Middle Ages particularly, but Christendom in, uh, uh, in general, and rediscovering uh, classical antiquity, pre-Christian Greece, pre-Christian Rome, uh, paganism. Uh, whereas the uh, the neo medievalists, uh, the romantics who wanted to to rebel, uh, react against the empiricism of the anti Christian Enlightenment, played leapfrog over the whole period of the late Renaissance and the Enlightenment, and rediscovered the Middle Ages, and then hence various types of neo medievalism. Well, Hopkins was doing something similar. Um, he was also playing leapfrog. The, 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 what was dynamic about his poetry was the dynamism of orthodoxy uh, and tradition, um, which led to an inspired innovation. So he takes old ideas um, and, if you like, does new things with them. So what are these new things? And let's look at them one by one. So basically, the, 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 the three concepts we want to understand what was so new and radical and revolutionary as perceived by uh, the 20th century about Hopkins. One was sprung rhythm, 
The other was InScape, and the third is InStress. So these are technical terms. Don't be intimidated by them. Um, I'm going to hopefully explain very, very simply what they are. So we'll begin with Sprung Rhythm. So from the time of the uh, Renaissance, um, uh, even a little bit earlier, uh, the, the the poetry was very much um, in uh, the form of poetry was was normally very um, regular in terms of, of, of meter and rhyme, um, certain certain uh, number of syllables per line, a certain rhyme schemes, uh, and uh, although Hopkins did normally follow fairly strict rhyme schemes, he did not follow strict um, metrics. Uh, the, the the, the number of syllables in, in, in his lines varied, breaking breaking the rules. So, for instance, octosyllabic verse has eight syllables per line. Um, uh, uh, so an octosyllabic tetrameter has eight syllables per line, four beats per line. Um, and certainly Hopkins could do that. If we have a look at The Habit of Perfection, one of his, play, uh, one of his poems, this is the form that it, this is the regular conventional form that most poets are writing in he could do it and Dutton could do it well so i'll just read the first stanza elected silence sing to me and beat upon my walled ear pipe me to pleasure pasture still and be the music that i care to hear all right so uh this is a regular rhythm right there's uh, eight syllables per per line there's four beats for, per line um so uh that's that was conventional rhyme, but but Hopkins broke from that with sprung ry rhythm, where it was not about the number of syllables which can vary. It's about the number of stresses, the number of of, of syllables on which we laid stress to create the sprung rhythm, um, and the punctuation is used to interrupt the flow, slowing it down. Uh, the emphasis on stressing certain syllables, not counting them. Uh, imitates this, Hopkins says this imitates the rhythm of speech. There's a music in speech that we don't think about. Um, so, for instance, we don't speak like this. I am saying to you now something in monotone. Um, we don't speak like that. Thanks be to God. <laughs> you know, we, we we speak with a rhythm. We have intonation. Um, there's there's a there's a there's a, a singing involved in the, the in the music of the human voice, human speech. So he he invokes this uh, in the organisation of stresses. Um, but the uh, he also talks about it 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 um, reflecting the 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 rhythm of traditional nursery rhymes. Um, so, for instance, three blind mice, three, oh, sorry, I won't sing. I'm going to have to stop myself from singing. <laughs> three blind mice, I can't stop myself from singing. Three blind mice, see how they run, see how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife. Okay, so you see the number of syllables varies. Three blind mice is only three syllables. Um uh, three blind mice, three blind mice, three syllables. Um, see how they run. Right, four syllables. They all ran after the farmer's wife. I count those. They all run after the farmer's wife. Nine syllables. But it's following just three rhythms per line. So he's he's using these uh, um, uh, different uh, ways of conveying um, meter. Uh, within within poetry he this is also very influenced by welsh poetry uh, he learned the welsh language when he was studying for the jesuit priesthood and fell very much in love with 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 welsh poetry in the welsh language but also anglo-saxon poetry anglo-saxon poetry is all about certain stressed syllables not about a certain uh, uh, uh the, the number of syllables per line he also uses sound very much as music and of course it's used by other poets but he does it to an exceptional degree. Some people that might not like Hopkins might say an excessive degree. So he uses alliteration, uh, the you know, the uh, the repetition of certain consonants, uh, assonance, the repetition of certain vowel sounds, onomatopoeia, using words that sound like the thing they describe. 
Um, so all of these things uh, conveying the music of his poetry. Um, so part part of one thing about this, he says that his poetry should not be read, but should be heard and spoken. So there's something that that's uh, sensual that needs to be incarnated in, in it. The, the music of the poem is such that it needs to be heard. We need to not, not just read it that somehow when 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 it's read aloud as something incarnational happens the words become flesh spoke so to speak all right so that's sprung rhythm and when i want to talk about inscape and this is where dun scotus comes in this medieval uh um philosopher franciscan um during the golden age of scholasticism so in the same century as um as saint thomas aquinas for instance now I, I know that uh, I've had many discussions with Thomists about this, and 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 um, I, I'm not going, to, not least because I don't think I would do a very good job of it. But I'm not going to try to go into the the, the depths of what Dan Scotus was teaching or what he wasn't teaching. What I'm going to do is to is to is to describe to you how it influenced Hopkins. But key the key thing is that 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 Dan Scotus taught something in Latin. Uh, the word is hechetas or hesetas. And it means thisness, and it is it's distinct from quiditas, uh, the 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 thatness or whatness of a thing. So, for instance, um, Saint Thomas Aquinas, following Aristotle, would was, was, was say that all oak trees have uh, an oak tree ness that that this that, that first of all connects all oak trees together but also separates oak trees from sycamore trees uh, and other types of trees that oak treeness that thing which uh, which uh, um is the the distinguishing feature should we say uh, of um of all oak trees is its quiditas right it's 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 thatness whatness Dun Scotus went further I say some Thomists would say he went too far, but that's, again, that's another discussion. He said that yes, of course, uh, he agrees, doesn't disagree with what uh, Thomas Aquinas and, and Aristotle and others are saying. He says all oak trees do have an oak tree ness, their quiditas, but they also have uh, an hechetas, a thisness. Uh, that, in other words, that every oak tree uh, is also unique. It's not merely a copy of the others, even though it shares liquidity liquiditas um and of course we now know this we can we can talk, we can, dis, we can discuss this describe this metaphysically or physically physically i have friends who are microbiologists who will tell you that that's absolutely true at the microbiological level uh, every cell of an acorn is unique uh, from all other acorns and no two acorns are identical so it's like our fingerprints that there is a there is a, an authentic thisness in that sense uh, to every oak tree um, on a metaphysical level it's because God doesn't mass produce now you, you we were all now used to seeing mass produce things in plastic uh, that are produced by a, a mold and a machine that mass produces them and they all look identical of course the, the the atoms in them are not identical but the point is this is mass produced by machines God does not mass produce in that way. Um, he's not a factory. Uh, he loves things into being. And because God loves things into being, they are unique, uh, unique um, uh, offspring of his thought and will, shall we say. So this was what um, what, what really uh, inspired Hopkins and he flushed with a new enthusiasm because now he could see uh, everything in the cosmos as unique. And this, could, this can, by the way, can apply to individual things, such as an oak tree, or a combination of individual things, such as a landscape, or a combination of individual things moving through time, such as an event. So possibly his greatest poem is The Wreck of the Deutschland, which is a, a, the story, a story about the unique presence of god in an in a natural disaster in the in the wrecking of a ship off the coast of england resulting in one quarter of the people on board being uh, uh either drowned or killed by ex exposure where's the presence of god in this unique event so the, that was the 
the Hechetas or the inscape of that natural disaster. But also he, he writes a book, called, uh, a poem called Binzi Poplars about a landscape of poplar trees. Um, or he can write about the Windhofer, a, a kestrel, about one particular bird. But in each case, the inscape is the unique, uh, the, the uniqueness of the being as being representative of the love of God for it. And, 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 and so that's, that's inscape. So the, the third thing we have to talk about um, before we look at some of his poetry with the time we have left uh, is in stress. So he said, sprung rhythm, in scape, if you like, the soul of things beyond their physical properties, one way of looking at it, the spiritual reality of something um, beyond its merely physical properties, uh, the love within which they were created. All right, they're created by the love of God. There's that divine love that's present in the beauty of the thing. But in stress is the, the moment when we see that, all right? It's there anyway, whether we see it or not. Beauty is not in the eye of the beholder, it's in the thing beheld. Um, if we don't behold the beauty of a sunset, it's not because the sunset's not beautiful, it's because we're blind, either physically or metaphysically, spiritually. We, just, we don't bother to look or we don't care. Uh, we're too wrapped up in our own selfish uh, uh, thoughts that we don't we don't experience the beauty but it's not because it's not there beauty is not in the eye of the beholder it's in the thing beheld so in stress is the moment when we behold it when we see the beauty in a thing or a landscape or an event uh as the eureka moment the i have found it or more to the point i have seen it um and it, it's that moment of epiphany that moment of showing forth the love of god in the presence of beauty as made manifest to our senses um, which is the moment of instress. And of course, this is also the moment of poetic inspiration when the poet sees the beauty in something, sees the divine presence in something, and then by the grace of God and using the God-given talents he's given, is inspired to write a beautiful, a beautiful poem uh, about it. All right, so with the few minutes we have left, I'm going to finish with a, with a, a simple poem by, by, by Hopkins called Rosa Mystica. Uh, and it's quite long, but I think we're going to, because it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful hymn of praise to the Blessed Virgin. And it's, it's, it's simple. But I want to look at one or two of the more, shall we say, complex, complicated aspects of, of, uh, of Hopkins's poetry. I want to look at the wreck of the Deutschland particularly. Uh, and, and one, a book I would like to write, and God willing, I will write. I'd like to write a whole book about this poem. So it's basically the, the, the heading under it uh, is written uh, oh, it's about an event that happened on December the 6th, December the 7th, 1875. And it's dedicated to the happy memory of five Franciscan nuns, exiles by the folklores, drowned between midnight and morning of December the 7th, 1875. So this was the inspiration. He reads in the newspaper about this shipwreck and especially about there being five franciscan sisters amongst those that were on the wreck none of whom survived but of, of these five sisters one was a tall nun over six foot six foot tall and all the newspaper reports talked about how she called people to repentance prayer and repentance in the midst of this um this this storm that that could claim their lives and and, and did claim the lives of one fourth of them and this was the inspiration, this, uh, this, this giantess of a nun, like a St. John the Baptist figure in the midst of uh, uh, this natural disaster, calling people to repentance and prayer uh, prior to their death. And then the poem is actually divided into 35 stanzas. My, the idea for my book would be to write about a thousand words on each of the stanzas. Part the first, so the first part, uh, is, is the first 10 stanzas is a mystical meditation upon the mystery of suffering uh, and then the second part or part the second the remaining 25 stanzas is a, a a narrative account of the shipwreck and the and the, and the role of the nuns in that except it's all seen uh through the inscape of what's happening in other words he's trying to see what's happening in the light of the presence and the love of god so in, in, in the midst of a natural suffering, a nat natural disaster with great suffering, where is God's presence? 
So let me maybe read one stanza from uh, the first part on the on the on the, on the uh, mystery of suffering, and then well, read one part from the second. Uh, where at, where should I be? What should I read? Really, I mean, all right, let's read this one because this is stanza four. I am soft sift in an hourglass at the wall, fast, but mind with a modern motion adrift, and it crowds and it combs to the fall. I steady as a water in a well to a poise to a pain, but roped with always all the way down from the tall fells off flanks of the foil, a vein of the gospel proffer, a pressure, a principle, Christ's gift. Now, <laughs> um, that takes some unpacking. That's why I want to write the book. This is not an easy poem. And probably if you've ever heard of this poem before and, and you just heard me reading it, not necessarily particularly well, you're going to wonder what on earth all that was about. Um, well, I just got look, let's just look at the first uh, seven words then just to just get, lead you in. I am soft sift in an hourglass. Not only is that a beautiful beautiful phraseology with um, some good alliteration and onomatopoeia, soft sift. So this is a, this is the vision is of an hourglass, a, you know, an egg time if you like, right? The sands of time, and you know our, when our life begins, it's turned over. Each of us is soft sift in an hourglass. Uh, we have a certain length of time when the sands of time are passing through us, uh, and when that sand is run out, we die. All of us are soft sift in an hourglass so anyway, this is a memento mori a reminder of death and then we just read i'm actually gonna probably in the second one second part i can begin with yeah let's read the first part of first stanza of the second part some find me a sword some the flange and the rail flame fang or flood goes death on drum and storms bugle his fame. But we dream we are rooted in earth, dust. Flesh falls within sight of us. We, though our flower the same, wave with the meadow, forget that there must the sour scythe cringe and the blear share come. So basically this is, you know, some find me a sword, some at the flange and the rail, so the railway, flame, fang or fang. Flood goes death on drum. We don't know how we're going to die. There are various ways we can die. Violently, accidentally, nat natural causes. Um, but we are all going to die. It's the egalitarianism of death. And this is death on drum. It's reminding us, banging the drum for death, if you like, to remind us that we are mortal and we need to bear that in mind and that we are, as phrased there, we dream we are rooted in earth. Dust. All right, now I'm going to finish this uh, before we before I um, finish the whole thing with this wonderful prayer to the Blessed Virgin with the final stanza of the poem, which is a prayer to the deceased nun, uh, the deceased Franciscan sister whom uh, Hopkins basically canonizes and prays to at the end. Dame at our door, drowned and among our shoals, Remember us in the roads, the heaven haven of the reward. Our king back, oh, upon English souls. Let him Easter in us, be a day spring to the dimness of us. He, a crimson cresseted east, more brightening her rare dear Britain as his reign rolls, pride, rose, prince, Hero of us, high priest, our hearts, charities, hearths, fire, our thoughts, chivalries, throngs, Lord. Well, if you didn't understand it all, I hope you realise how beautiful it was. All right, and I, I'm going to now just conclude. We could say much more about this wonderful Jesuit priest and poet, but I'm going to let him speak for himself by finishing with his hymn to the Virgin, Rosa Mystica. Rosa Mystica, of course, is one of the titles to the Blessed Virgin given in the uh, Litany of Loretto, the Litany of the Blessed Virgin. Rosa Mystica by Gerard Manley Hopkins. The rose is a mystery. Where is it found? Is it anything true? Does it grow upon ground? 
It was made of earth's mould, but it went from men's eyes, and its place is a secret and shut in the skies. In the gardens of God, in the daylight divine, find me a place by thee, mother of mine. But where was it formerly? Which is the spot that was blessed in it once, though now it is not? It is Galilee's growth. It grew at God's will and broke into bloom upon Nazareth hill. In the gardens of God, in the daylight divine, I shall look on thy loveliness, mother of mine. What was its season then? How long ago? When was the the summer that saw the bud blow? Two thousands of years are near upon past, since its birth and its bloom and its breathing its last. In the gardens of God, in the daylight divine, I shall keep time with thee, mother of mine. Tell me the name now, tell me its name. The heart guesses easily, is it the same? Mary the Virgin, well the heart knows, she is the mystery, she is the rose. In the gardens of God, in the daylight divine, I shall come home to thee, mother of mine. Is Mary the rose then, Mary the tree? But the blossom, the blossom there, who can it be? Who can her rose be? It could but be one, Christ Jesus our Lord, her God and her Son. In the gardens of God, in the daylight divine, show me thy Son, mother, mother of mine. What was the colour of that blossom bright, white to begin with, immaculate white, but what a wild flush on the flakes of it stood when the rose ran, ran, when the rose ran in crimsonings down the cross wood. In the gardens of God, in the daylight divine, I shall worship the wounds with thee, mother of mine. How many leaves had it? Five. They were then, five like the senses and members of men. Five is their number by nature, but now they multiply, multiply. Who can tell how? In the gardens of God, in the daylight divine, make me a leaf in thee, mother of mine. Does it smell sweet too in that holy place? Sweet unto God, and the sweetness is grace. The breath of it bathes great heavens above in grace that is charity, grace that is love. To thy breast, to thy rest, to thy glory divine, draw me by charity, mother of mine. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Authority. Please do join me next time. Until then, goodbye, God bless, and good reading. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.